Good morning. He is risen. He is risen indeed. He is risen just as he said. We've reached about the month mark since we've been together in person the last time. In some ways it feels like an eternity, and in some ways it feels like yesterday. I know many of you are upset that it's Easter Sunday, Resurrection Sunday, and we're not able to gather together to worship on a day like this. And I know you get annoyed when I say this, but every Sunday is Resurrection Sunday. So we celebrated Easter when we met in March, and we will celebrate Easter again when we meet again, whenever that is. Uh, the Bible doesn't make any distinction in putting one Sunday as more important or as better than the other. And in God's eyes, all Lord's days are equally important and equally holy. With that being said, I will call you to worship this Resurrection Sunday, April 12th, by reading to you the Gospel account of the Resurrection from Mark's Gospel. I'll be reading Mark's Gospel, chapter 16. Now when the Sabbath was passed, Mary Magdalene, Mary the mother of James, and Salome brought spices that they might come and anoint him very early in the morning on the first day of the week. They came to the tomb when the sun had risen, and they said among themselves, Who will roll away the stone from the door of the tomb for us? But when they looked up, they saw that the stone had been rolled away, for it was very large. And entering the tomb, they saw a young man clothed in a long white robe sitting on the right side, and they were alarmed. But he said to them, Do not be alarmed. You seek Jesus of Nazareth, who is crucified. He is risen. He is not here. See the place where they laid him. But go, tell his disciples and Peter that he is going before you into Galilee. There you will see him, as he said to you. So they went out quickly and fled from the tomb, for they trembled and were amazed, and they said nothing to anyone, for they were afraid. Now when he rose early on the first day of the week, he appeared first to Mary Magdalene, out of whom he had cast seven demons. She went and told those who had been with him, as they mourned and wept, and when they heard that he was alive and had been seen by her, they didn't believe. After that, he appeared in another form to two of them as they walked and went into the country. And they went and told it to the rest, but they did not believe them either. Later he appeared to the eleven as they sat at the table, and he rebuked their unbelief and hardness of heart, because they did not believe those who had seen him after he had risen. And he said to them, Go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. He who believes and is baptized will be saved, but he who does not believe will be condemned. And these signs will follow those who believe. In my name they will cast out demons, they will speak with new tongues, they will take up serpents. If they drink any dead, anything deadly, it will by no means hurt them. They will lay hands on the sick, and they will recover. So then, after the Lord had spoken to them, he was received up into heaven and sat down at the right hand of God. And they went out and preached everywhere, the Lord working with them, and confirming the word through the accompanying signs. Amen. I would ask you to join me in prayer as we go before the Lord in worship this morning. Our dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for the testimony of the resurrection. We thank you for the life that we have because of it. We thank you for the victory that it signifies. We pray that we would not be as the disciples here in this passage who wouldn't believe the account or the testimony of those who had seen, who had understood and had accepted. We pray that we would be those of true faith, faith based on real evidence, on your word. And we pray that as we meditate on your life, death, and resurrection, we pray that we would come to seek you and follow you and love you and adore you all the more. We ask that you would hear us as we worship this morning and we confess our sin to you. We would have no need of a Savior 
And we would not be celebrating a resurrection if we weren't sinners. We confess our sin. We confess our wickedness. We confess our evil. We confess our selfishness. We confess that even in a situation of difficulty, we are often totally consumed with ourself instead of loving you and loving our neighbor. Forgive us for this. Forgive us for our cheating, our lying, our deception. Help us to keep you first in all things. May we know the assurance of your salvation as we know the assurance of Christ's resurrection. And may we live and walk in that resurrection and that truth. We lift up to you prayers this morning, and we plead that you would continue to have your presence with all of those working directly in this time of virus and sickness. We pray that you'd be with every health care worker, doctors, nurses, aides, suppliers, everyone. We pray for all those arms and legs and hands and that, are, that are helping to build up and care for your image bearers. We pray that you'd encourage, that you'd give rest, that you'd undertake, and that they would know that your presence is real and providing. We pray for everyone else who's working in businesses that have not closed, those who are in food distribution, those who are uh, in construction, those who are in uh, uh, first responders, those who are keeping functioning the daily needs that we have. Supply their needs. Lord, we pray that you'd give wisdom to those who are our representatives. People in Congress and legislature, elected officials like governors and presidents, direct them, guide them, give them your wisdom. May your truth, your knowledge, your intelligence be given to them. May they know what to do and may they know what is right. And may you please show them what is right. Lord, for everyone in our church, help those who are ill, who are weak, help those who have been dealing with illnesses already, help those who are struggling financially, and help them to get through this. I pray that as your children in the wilderness didn't have their clothes wear out or their, or their, or their shoes wear out, that this would be a situation where your people also never run out of what they need, and that you would care and bless and keep and sustain and provide. May we testify of you, as we just read, as your disciples preached the gospel everywhere, may we also do that. And while we may feel that we are under quarantine, we still have a multitude of ways of being in contact with people in order to preach the gospel. May we do it. May our light shine. May your grace abound where sin abounds. And may salvation be known and accepted. Stir up hearts and minds to accept the truth and to have eternal life and for that life to be based solely on Christ and on Christ alone. We pray that as we turn to your word now, you would also soften hearts and minds. May all of us have our souls affected through this message. May all of us know the Savior more, delight in him more, follow him more, and be more obedient to him. May we have the, our assurance even more guaranteed in our, in our souls and in our resolve and in our mind and heart. And may we live like it's real, not like it's just a story. Bless us, keep us, go with us, care for us. For we ask it and plead it and pray it. In Jesus' precious name, amen. So we read the gospel account of the resurrection. I'm now going to ask you to turn, if you would, to the book of the Revelation. Revelation chapter 1. Revelation chapter 1, and I'm going to ask you to bring your attention to verses 17 and 18. The situation is that the Apostle John is a prisoner on the Isle of Patmos, an old man, has now seen the resurrected and ascended Lord. He's been revealed to him. And in verse 17, it says, John testifies, 
And when I saw him, I fell at his feet as dead. But he laid his right hand on me, saying to me, Do not be afraid. I am the first and the last. I am he who lives and was dead. And behold, I am alive forevermore. Amen. And I have the keys of Hades and death. What could be more fundamental than the concept of life and death? Is there anything that we would say is more important than matters of life and death? Yet, many find the overall weight of thinking about life and its meaning uh, as a concept to dismiss or as a concept to pass off to philosophers and maybe clergymen. I don't have the time, I don't have the know-how, I don't want to be bothered, I can't think on such weighty matters. I can't think on the meaning of life, that's too deep of a question for me. And I would submit that if the meaning of life is too deep or too weighty or too terrific of a question for you, that you rethink how you approach that. You are alive right now. And since you are alive, you have an obligation to consider life. You have an obligation to consider its meaning. Your life exists right now. If you're hearing this, your life exists. And according to your creator, your life has a meaning. And your creator has told you that its meaning is to live for his glory and to enjoy him in the process of living for his glory. Now, if life is a weighty concept and something that you don't care to think about or you don't care to dwell on, even more so is the concept of death. Even less we want to think about death or meditate on death. I always find it amusing how life insurance commercials like to put it so lightly and, and so carefully. Uh, you will need this for your loved ones when you're gone. Gone? Gone where? The world can talk about death in such a way as if it's not real or as it's never going to happen or as if it's this, this concept in the future. We all know it's an eventual reality, but pretend it's a light thing. One day when you're gone. Well, death is sure, and you are going to die. Your body will expire, whether it's from a virus, or whether it's from some sickness, or whether it's from an accident, or whether it's from who knows. You can say all those things are the cause of a death, but when it comes down to it, the cause of death is actually birth. You are going to die. Now, the message of the gospel is a matter of life and death. The message of the gospel is the most needed message, the most important message, and the most vital thing you could ever hear and encounter and meditate on and accept and think on and believe. It is a matter of life and death. We're not talking about mere tradition, mere religiosity here. We're not just doing this because all oh, Christians have gathered together for thousands of years to worship the Lord, and isn't it nice thing that we do on Sunday mornings? No, this is a matter of life and death. It's, it's, it's a grave situation. It's a grave message. But thankfully, your God doesn't leave you to wonder or to make up something. Your God doesn't leave you to write a fiction of what the meaning is or where we're going or why there's death. Your God has told you where you came from. He's told you why you die. And thankfully, and praise him, praise his name, he's told you how to prevent eternal death and damnation. God the Son is alive. He's alive forevermore. And in belief, we face life and death with his words of comfort and his words of confidence. We face everything 
with the words that he says here to his apostle, do not be afraid. Now, here in chapter 1, I've already said John the Apostle is finding himself before the ascended and glorified Christ. Now, John knew the Lord Jesus. John was very much acquainted with the Lord Jesus. We know John as the beloved disciple, the one who laid his head on Jesus at the Last Supper. Note that when he encounters the Lord Jesus again, he doesn't give him a high five, and he doesn't say, How you doing, buddy? He falls down as if he were dead. The terror and holiness and power and glory and greatness and awe of the risen and resurrected and glorified Christ is so intense. The holiness is so intense that very much like Isaiah, he has to fall down and say, I am unworthy. I am so sinful. I am before you in such a, a state of humility that I cannot even look upon you. If you have a very common and casual view of God, if you have a very light view of God, you have the opportunity right now to get real with God and who He is and to match up your view of God with John's the Apostle's view of God right here. You have the opportunity to understand your own inadequacy and His superiority. You have the opportunity to recognize that before a holy God, you can but fall down at your feet on your face as dead. The beauty of this picture, though, and the beauty of these sentences that we've read, is that it's also a picture of grace, a graceful relationship. Because God has condescended to have relationship. We don't have to know him only as this terrifying judge. And while our response in human state, and John's response as a human before him is to fall down, notice that in this passage the Lord reaches out in warmth, in condescension, in beauty and in truth, and puts his right hand on John to comfort him. And he says, do not be afraid. Can I recommend to you, as much as you get your understanding of a holy God right, that you also understand that God has reached out to you and done this and says, do not be afraid? If you are a Christian, if you believe, then this picture should go with you in every situation that you face, every circumstance. No matter how difficult, no matter how scary, God is with you. And God's presence, His living presence, comforts you. You ought to know His hand on you. You ought to know that peace. And you ought to know those words that say, do not be afraid, I am with you. I will never leave you. I will never forsake you. I have you, you are mine. When I was a baby, we used to go and visit uh, the Cape May Lighthouse. And as a baby, my dad would put me in that backpack thing for infants and carry me up the lighthouse steps to the top. Well, when I got older, I was too big for that, and I had to start to climb the steps myself. But when I was still very small, I could only make so many steps. They were narrow, they were steep, and there were a lot of them, and my little legs couldn't get that far. And so maybe halfway up, my dad would still have to carry me. Now, if you've been in these lighthouses, you know that these cast iron steps, you can see through them, they have holes. And so I remember looking, and you could see the whole length of that lighthouse all the way down, and I remember feeling very insecure. But then I remembered my dad saying, don't worry, I've got you, I'm holding you. Well, there's a picture of how the Lord Jesus holds us through everything. We're His. We're not our own. And we're safe in His arms. So as holy as He is and as great and as mighty as He is, He is also condescended to relationship with us so that He can say, do not be afraid. Okay, great. Do not be afraid. Well, I need a little bit more of an understanding of why I shouldn't be afraid. Well, you have to know this God. Do not be afraid. Why? 
because I am the first and I am the last. Do not be afraid, I have you. Why? I am. If anyone or anything should give us comfort, it is the I am, the great I am. He's essentially saying, I am existence itself. I made life. I take away life. I am all. I am in all. I know all. I see all. I am the greatest power you can ever comprehend. Are you really going to struggle with fear knowing that I have you and I'm telling you do not to be afraid? Are you really going to worry about things like unemployment? Are you really going to worry about things like sickness, like hospitalization, like death? When I am the I am and I have told you that I am the beginning and the end, I am the first and the last and that I have you and that I know all this from the beginning and that your life is mine, not your own, and that you are secure in me? Are are you really going to worry and fear? Do not fear. I am. See, the gospel of the Lord Jesus, again, brings us to a, a level of, of absolute assurance when he tells us about himself. The scriptures are always before us because we keep forgetting this gospel. We keep forgetting the mercy and love and security of the gospel. That's why we have to preach it every week. That's why we have to read it every day. That's why we have to pray it every hour, all through the day. That's why we have to soak this in. We can't complain about getting tired of hearing the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. It is so essential to our daily functioning because without it, we immediately forget it or we make something up that's not true or we make something up that is false we are so prone to that but he says I am he who is the first and the last the greatest the amen and he says I am alive to testify to the truth he lives, it says, and was dead. Notice that it doesn't say he was alive. It says he lives and was dead. The meaning is that he was always alive. From before time was invented, God was alive. God exists outside time. There was never a point that he was not the living God. Never. He was always in existence. Now, he took on human life to be the, the perfect God-man, as we talked about on Good Friday. But in John chapter 18, 37, he says this to Pilate. He says, for this I came into the world to testify to the truth. He was alive. I, I live forever. I'm alive and was dead. But I came into the world alive as a human to testify to the truth. We know from the Gospels that he says, I am truth. I am life. And he says, here, know me. Believe my words. I testify to myself as the truth. I am alive to do this. I ever live to do this. The living God here on earth to testify to his own saving truth. He says, I was alive in verse 18. I am he who lives and was dead. I said earlier that uh, the cause of death is essentially birth. Well, birth in sin. Because of human sin, we have to die. The Lord Jesus did not have to die. He had no sin. He took ours vicariously. He was our substitute. He bled, suffered, endured wrath in our place. He knew death in a way that no Christian ever will. You ever considered that? The Lord Jesus knew death in a way that you and I who believe in him never will. He took the wrath of God on him in our place. 
He took that so that we do not have to die, so that we do not have to suffer, so that we do not have hell and damnation upon us. He died in our place. And he's testifying to that when he says that here in verse 18. I am he who lives and was dead. The Son died for you in your place. I am he who lives and was dead, and behold, I am alive forevermore. When we say he is risen, that's not just a religious mantra. That's not just something we do to be cute. We say it because his resurrection really means our eternal life. Uh, it's not wishful thinking either. Resurrection is fact. It's brutal, hard, firm, absolute fact. It has witnesses, it has documentation, and it has lasting evidence of testimony for 2,000 years. John does not stand here on Patmos going, uh, what did I eat to see all these things? John's not standing there going, this must be some type of dream. No, John knows that what he is seeing and hearing is truthful. He knows that this is absolutely real, and he knows that this is the Lord who rose and ascended on high. He knows that he lives. He knows that he's here speaking to him. And he knows that he's al alive forevermore. When he says, I live forevermore, amen, yes. We know that all the promises in him are yes and amen. And because he lives, we know that there is life eternal. We know that there is eternal salvation. He is the guarantee of that. He is the surety of that. He's the first fruits of that. This is the evidence. This is the truth. This is the reality. This is the fact of our great God and of his resurrection. I am he who lives and was dead, and behold, I am alive forevermore. Amen. Yes. We're told that in 1 Corinthians 15, that the last enemy that will ever be put to death is death itself. Because the Lord Jesus is alive, your soul in him will never die. But we also know that the day is coming when true physical death will also be abolished. Spiritual death for the Christian right now is an impossibility. You will exist forever in the presence of God, and you will have purpose and meaning in that eternity in the presence of God. But at the last, physical death for the Christian will also be an impossibility, will also be wiped away. We see again in verse 18 that he says, I have the keys of Hades and death. I have the keys of hell and death. We use phrases sometimes that we don't even stop to think about. The key to the problem, the key witness, the key solution. We use the term, the key of it is, the key of the matter. We talk about keys a lot. We don't even think about it. Key means that you have, an, uh, that it is the, the solution to a problem. And when you take your keys and when you open your, the door to your house, you are exerting your authority of ownership over that house. I own this house. I have the way to get in. I am in possession of this domain, as it were. To have a key to something shows that you have the authority and the ownership over it. Well, Jesus has the key, meaning he is the solution to the problem, but he also has ownership over that. And he says, I have the key to death and to hell. Do not fear death or the grave. I have the keys to it. It doesn't run rampant. It doesn't run and do its own thing. I control it. I hold it. I am the answer and the solution to death and Hades. I am the master of your eternity. I control it. It's not something that you have to run from or hide from when you're with me. I've got it. He is the source of your solutions because he holds the key to life and death. And that key is belief and faith in him. We're told again in 1 Corinthians 15 that death is swallowed up in victory. Death has no sting. Death is... In Christ, over.
because he is alive. Do not fear death or the grave. Now, I say that, and we probably nod our heads, and we probably go, Amen. But then, circumstances arise that we start fearing death and the grave. Well, your Savior's voice resounds throughout the ages, saying, I am the resurrection of the light and the life. Do not fear. He who believes in me shall never die. I say that at, at every funeral I have ever done, because it's what the Lord Jesus testifies to as the truth. I am the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me shall never die. Okay, if you're never going to die, then what are you afraid of? If you are a Christian, if you are a Christian and you're afraid of death, then you need a bigger God. If you're not a Christian and you're afraid of death, you need a bigger God. Your time is fixed from the foundation of existence. You were put here in his will of time, and you'll be taken out in his will of time. Trust the master. Trust the owner of the keys. Trust the, the I am, the king of all the kingdom. In him we have everlasting life. But let's always remember... And this is also meant to give us security and peace and rest and assurance in the matters of life and death. Let's remember that the life we have has nothing to do with us. We have eternal life not because we've earned it, not because we've done something to impress him, not because, uh, not because we are holy or righteous in any way and have checked the boxes and have made the, uh, made the, uh, uh, the, the mark. No. We have life by grace through faith. And grace as it's, and on its foundational understanding means that it is all of His doing. It is unearned favor. I know some of you are uncomfortable with the concept of predestination, that your soul is predestined from eternity past. I know that makes some of us uncomfortable. Some, but if you are comfortable with grace, and I know everyone's comfortable with grace, uh, you can't have grace without predestination. If it is all of grace, if it is all of God and not of you, if he did it totally by himself, if it is the gift of God by grace through faith of eternal life, and he's giving it to you all of his own accord, then he controls when? He controls all of it. You didn't make the decision. There wasn't anything that you were able to harness in and of yourself to get your salvation. If you believe in grace, you know that God is in control. He really is the master. He really is the one in control. He really is the sovereign. If it weren't so, it wouldn't be grace. He gives you the faith to believe him based on the evidence of his word. He provides, he sustains, he directs you, he is with you. He died, but he lives forevermore. You were dead in trespasses and sins. And now you are alive by grace in Christ Jesus. The struggle is over. The battle is won. The victory is Christ's. This is a matter of life and death. This is a matter of your eternity. This is a matter of magnificent, magnificent, glorious God. If you're considering these things, and you're considering the fragility of the world, and you're considering how easy things can come and go in this world, be assured that your God never comes and goes. He's not fragile. He's permanent. He's secure. He's the only thing you have to put your trust in that you could be absolute about. And he offers that gift of eternal life to you through his son, the Lord Jesus, who died but is alive forevermore. He did this for your sake, for God's glory. You don't have to die. When he said, it is finished, as his last words on the cross, it was a sure, full end that he accomplished it all. And death is over. Live forevermore for him. For his glory, obeying his word, enjoying his truth, embracing him. 
knowing and feeling his right hand on your shoulder, saying, do not fear. I am your way, your truth, and your life. Trust him. Believe on him. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you tremendously for grace that you, in your holiness and your magnificence, gave us eternal life. You who did not have to die sent your Son into the world to die for us on our behalf as a substitute. And we have assurance and eternal life because of him. We rejoice in that and we praise you for it. Give us the grace to live in that every day, to have no fear, to trust you through all hardship, and to know that you have the keys to everything and you are our master. May we love you all the more for it. May we know your peace that passes all understanding. And may you go with us, encouraging us to obedience and to live a life for you. We ask your blessing and your application of this. In Jesus' name, amen. May you all have a great, glorious, wonderful, blessed Sabbath day together. I will hopefully see you in the not too distant future in person. In the meantime, continue to worship together through these online means. God bless you.